Welcome to UK Business Show, UK's premier business show where we feature business thought leaders, high achievers, and industry experts. Today's episode is brought to you by World Outsourcing Solutions Limited, a company that specializes in helping executive business owners with virtual assistant services and business growth systems. Here's your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. It's Trevor with you today, and I'm joined by Rick Mayo on this episode. Now, Rick's been a business owner in the fitness realm since 1992. Yes, that's a long time, so he knows his stuff. He's the founder and the CEO of the Alloy Personal Training Franchise System and has, with his team, served millions of members in thousands of fitness centers around the world. As well as being an award-winning business owner, Rick is also an international speaker and a writer, and he's passionate about helping others, which is why we love him being on the show. So welcome, Rick Mayo. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. No, no, it's great to have the opportunity to to chat to you. And we'll talk about leadership. We'll talk about the franchise system and all of that. But maybe just to kick us off, for those that haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting you, share a little bit of your your background or your journey that's brought you to, to where you are now and how you help people. Sure. So we, as you mentioned before, we opened our original facility in 1992, which does age me a bit. I know it's hard to believe if you're watching the video that it's... <laughs> I've been in business since 92, but we legitimately have. And at that point, I was a junior in university or college, as we call it. So junior in college, working my way through school as a personal trainer. And I thought, you know, it would be interesting if we could build four walls and experience around this high-end service of personal training. That's what we've always done. And we did. And so we opened one, as far as I know, one of the first ever fully dedicated facilities just to the service of personal training. Um and it went really well, you know, again, I finish school and, and get moving down the road and then personal training evolves and actually becomes a legitimate industry. You know, at first when we opened and you would tell someone what you did, they would ask you, you know, sort of in a, an inquisitive way without trying to be offensive, they would say, oh really, well, what else do you do? Because surely you can't actually carve a living out of teaching people how to exercise. It's like, well, you can, you know, but thanks for asking. I'm out of my parents' basement now. I'm gainfully employed. You know, it is a career. But the industry caught up quickly and became a legitimate industry. And there were certification bodies and, you know, business organizations and everything, you know, built around this service. And so um, we landed on a really interesting business model. We continued to expand our footprint. And we were approached by a large facility owner. Now, imagine we're dedicated to this, like, very boutique, expensive service. And then we're approached by a general service health club, right? So imagine in the UK, you're at David Lloyd clubs or whatever. You're paying a basic membership and you're using the club, yeah. but they still want to get you to a coach or personal training for a couple of reasons. You're going to be a better member and more successful, and they're also going to realize more revenue from you. And those are, it's a win-win all the way around. So they approached us and said, you've got a very interesting business model. Could you replace our personal training department in our facilities? Um, and it was like, yeah, well, I don't know. You know, at the time, like, we were the anti-large gym and that was our market position. But we thought, you know, that would be an interesting challenge. So we cleaned things up, we put them on an online platform and we launched what was our, what we called a licensing company. Now that term is somewhat interchangeable with franchising. So it could be a bit confusing, but imagine the difference between licensing and our terms in franchising was that we were powering another brand as a white labeled service, right? So yeah. we would help them like teach them to fish, so to speak. And then we would power it with sales systems, um, you know, everything from, you know, inductions for, for new customers, um, you know, actually writing the digitally driven workouts, all of those things in turnkey package. And that really took off as well. The, the original clubs that we worked with were very successful word got out. And before you knew it, we were working with, you know, 2,300 clubs worldwide, everywhere from, you know, Dubai to India to Cyprus to, you know, you, you name it, right. Tasmania, everywhere in between, um, a lot in the States, Canada, of course, UK as well. Um, and, and then in around 2019, we were being approached and we had done several white label projects for really big franchise structures. I mean, worldwide franchises, some of the largest overall franchises in the world, not just fitness. And so we had learned a good deal. You know, that put me in a, in a very interesting relationship with the franchises, you know, sitting in an advisory position, being able to really see how franchising works. Um, 
and also to see in varied markets all over the world where is there a gap in a certain market right like where is a what is a fitness service or a fitness sort of market that's underserved and do we have the right machine built to fill that gap and the answer was yes and so in 2020 we pivoted to full on franchising instead of licensing which means it would be you think of a McDonald's right it's going to have mm-hmm. all the same branding in every store just like any other like buttoned up franchise that you see now as you can imagine 2020 wasn't the ideal year to start a fitness franchise as fitness was not always seen as a viable service in all areas of the world. But now that the veil is lifted a bit, we're starting to maybe see the light at the end of the tunnel beyond this whole COVID situation. Um, It's going really well. So we're selling franchises well. We're getting them open, pre-selling well. And yeah, that's it. I mean, it's a 30 year, you know, of an overnight success, as they say, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure there were many ups and downs along along the journey. Oh, yeah. Um, Lots of things to learn as well. I feel, uh, just sort of curious in the sense of when you could you foresee when you first started um, heading into the fitness realm that yeah eventually the big picture plan is I'm going to start a franchise company and go around the world. I would love to say that it was part of my master plan all along, <laughs> but in all honesty, I had zero idea of where we were headed. And I think there's good and bad things to that. I mean, we talked you know, pre-recording here today a little bit about leadership. And I think, you know, from, from a leadership standpoint, it's really hard to know exactly where you're going to be. And even in five years, you know, technology is very disruptive. Things are moving quickly. So I think more importantly is that you have a culture set up in your business to be able to take advantage of opportunities, right? You're nimble enough and you have an open-minded culture where if new pro- information is presented, you don't allow confirmation bias and, you know, overconfidence and past decisions and all that to drive, you know, you to do the same things and end up as a blockbuster video or a Kodak or something like that, right? Yeah. Where you just ride your, your ideas right into the ground. And so that's the thing that maybe we did have. Mm-hmm. But to say that we had this master plan all along would be completely false. And a lot of things just fell into our lap. And the only thing that I can say that we did well was we had the right culture in place and we had our eyes open to opportunities so that we could take advantage of those when they presented themselves. Yeah, no, that's really good. I'm sure a lot of people listening and thinking, yeah, if, if I only knew where I turned out to be now, um, I'd have probably prepared differently, but also probably messed it up in the process because it, a lot of the time it's it's a growing journey for us isn't it as individuals the vision gets clearer and gets bigger as we get bigger in ourselves as we understand ourselves more as well so now that makes perfect sense that's actually encouraging and reassuring for me and i'm sure for everybody listening as well that, yeah yeah well, i think um if you have core values and, you, and you've got the right lenses on your life in general as a leader and you're making decisions that are with you know within your core values um then you're going to end up where you're supposed to end up and, I, and i'm not saying that means that there's not planning and things that happen yeah. in that framework i mean i'm sure you've heard of simon Sen- right and he's got the the now famous video and series that he's done on what he calls infinite game mm. and he basically says in, in corporate america or corporate in general um you know, everything is so finite and it goes quarter to quarter to appease shareholders or what have you. It's really a very short term outlook. And we've seen some of the negative side effects of that with big pharma, you know, buying up smaller companies, stripping out R and D. And, you know, it's just a, it's just a a very short term, short sighted play when really the idea should be the infinite game, meaning the whole goal should be just to keep going and to keep doing business. Now, that doesn't mean within that framework of an infinite game that there's not finite things that need to be scored, right? I mean, you you have to pay bills, you have to pay people, you have to be profitable, you have to grow. Those are finite things that can be measured. But I think when you zoom out as a leader, certainly if you're the head of your company, you really want to think about this idea of this infinite game. Um, and so that you know, that's where you're headed. The goal is just to keep going and you don't know exactly what that's going to look like in 10 years. But if you stick to your core values and you keep an open mind and you look for those opportunities, you're going to end up right where you're supposed to be. And it's going to be a pretty good place. Yeah. 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 No, I totally agree. That's what sharpens us, isn't it? Staying alert, staying open and being flexible um, to the whole growing process. Great book as well. Yes. For everybody listening, if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend reading The Infinite Game. Um, You mentioned about culture. I always think it's fascinating as well, but just what would be a couple of the things that you've underpinned, I suppose, the culture within your businesses that helps you stay flexible, helps you not hold on too tightly to old ideas and, you know, end up 
doing the same thing 10 years later, but you've actually adapted and pivoted, as you said. How, for people listening that have teams or maybe just one or two individuals, how can you set a good culture where you can adapt? Yeah, I think, I think part of it is, you know, there's, there's lots of, that's a, a lot to unpack, you know, but I, but I think one of the things that I know, at least for me, that I find really important is that you have a culture that allows for mistakes. You just mentioned earlier that the real growth comes in the mistakes, right? Yeah. And so you can put guardrails around behavior so that the mistakes aren't fatal to your business. But I think if you don't let people go and try to solve problems, right, and try to stretch and, and, and make sure that they feel safe owning a process or a decision, you know, even if it's critical, as long as it fits within these guardrails, that's a great culture to have because you're basically telling everyone that um, you're open to, to new experiences, that there's that, they, that, you know, we joke in our organization, the kiss of death is to say something like, well, this is the way we've always done it. It's like literally that would get you escorted out of the building because <laughs> at the end of the day, we're, you know, one of our five core values is to drive change, you know, not even to be accepting of it, but to drive it. And I think if that's part of your culture, then pe everyone on your team should feel free to act that way, right? If it's yeah. really drive change, you, you can't give that lip service as the leader and then chastise folks when they try something that doesn't work. It's like, well, that was a dumb idea. Or, you know, then you're going to get this apathetic, like, you know, staff or team that's just waiting for you to tell them what to do. And they're afraid to make mistakes because you can step on them if they do. And, you know, so I think it starts there. And, and maybe that's just a set of core values, but you have to actually live them. And then I think beyond that, like hiring the folks that fit that profile, right? I mean, it's one thing to, you know, when you bring someone in, they're going to interview really well and they're going to say, oh, you know, you're going to say these are our five core values. One of them is drive change. You know, are you resistant to change, right? And, and you really need to know. So we've got some personality analysis and things like that, that will stress test that idea because you're, you, again, you're just not going to be a good fit on our team. And we're not going to have a team that can look for new opportunities and pivot when it's needed. Right. Yeah. Um, if in fact we don't have the right people on the bus. And so I think the hiring process, you know, is very important as well. So I would say, you know, that's pretty much it is like have some core values and it has to start with you as a leader. You have to, you can't just put them on paper. You have to really believe them and you have to live them. And that means every team meeting, every interaction that you have, you are expressing that we are moving forward. We're looking for new opportunities. And you know what? Everyone in here is going to make mistakes and that is okay. As long as they're within these, again, these guardrail parameters. So it doesn't cost us too much then we're going to make mistakes. And by the way, it's encouraged. That's the way that we're going to learn, right? You can't grow without mistakes. Growth is inherently messy. There's going to be mistakes made. You should relish those. And if you're, you know, if you're not making mistakes, then, then you're not growing. And that's yeah. what it is. So if your team is perfect all the time, you're not doing anything significant. So I think just that, putting that into words and using every opportunity with every interaction with your team from hiring all the way through to they've been there 10 or 12 years, you're constantly reinforcing that message to them. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, because that keeps everything fresh, doesn't it? And then, as you say, encourages innovation, suggestions and experimentation, really, isn't it? So that's really good. I like that. Thank you. Enjoying this conversation. I knew I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed you nodding a bit. You've probably had several conversations on a weekly basis, <laughs> as I can yeah. imagine. It's, it's really good though because in some ways like leadership principles are universal um but the way they're expressed in different organizations different companies is down to the individual leaders the bosses the founders whoever's kind of setting the vision and then rolling it out really um but it's it's good to hear it from your perspective within the fitness realm as well um well culture's culture's such an interesting topic because depending on who you're speaking to that can mean different things right like uh, you know a lot of people think culture is nap pods free lunches scooters electric scooters at work you know and like if you talk to an organization like ours which we tend to just be a little bit more blunt force trauma and we work hard and we keep this culture like those some of those things that to me is not culture that's just creating like spoiled children right a yeah. culture is when you've got a group of people with a common vision that are working towards that vision and they're working for the person next to them right and all of these things that come together it's not really about all the window dressings because all that stuff still doesn't make a culture it's just stuff right in some ways it can be at the expense of your culture if you're not careful so I think, you know, just defining what, what does the culture mean to you? To me, it doesn't mean those things. It means like how we, how we interact with each other and yeah. how we work like on and what we're trying to do. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Values based culture, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I know that trust is one of the key values that you operate through and trust as a strategy is a phrase that you use. Elaborate a little bit more on that. What do you mean by that? Well, I think, um, 
you know, it, it's it's something that's lacking in modern society. I think we can all agree with whether it be distrust in the media or government or, you know, anything really private sector business, right? It's yeah. at an all time low. There's a great measurement for this called the Edelman Trust Barometer. So just by that name. So Edelman Trust Barometer, it's been out for a long time and they do a, an overall, you know, a barometer on worldwide trust. And they really use four categories. So they do government, non-government, which would be like something that marries up to the government, like maybe the Red Cross or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, media and then private sector business. And there wasn't, you know, and they've got the, you've got your competency and then the trust worthiness right on this sort of grid and there's not one of those entities that made it into the golden you know square which is competent and right trustworthy right ethical um, if you can imagine like media and government were way down in the not trustworthy not very ethical or not not competent not ethical right yeah. and the only one i think you had you know ethical but not competent was like the red cross the non-government entities right and then you had uh, private business which was competent but not ethical so no one really made it into the perfect area so when you look at that and you look at the current state of things, trust is a real currency. It is. And so, um, you know, being very genuine through all levels of communication, being, you know, just see through transparent, literally with your team and with your customers and with your potential customers. Um, I think it, it goes a long way these days because people are very sensitive right now to to distrust, I'd say more than anything. Um, but yeah, I know it's a really simple answer, but yeah, it's a, it's a straight up currency. And in any opportunity that you have to build trust with your customer base, your team, or your communities, you should do so with utmost of transparency um, and honesty, because there's really no other way around it. And anything but that is is going to fall short. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it comes back to bite people in the end as well, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Why would you operate in distrust and do business with someone in distrust uh it just doesn't make sense but it, it's, well, it's just not these... possible in this day and age right with the, the yeah. amount of information people have access to yeah um, it, it's not going to work so if that was your your mode of operation you know in the 70s and you're a big company you can't do that anymore right yeah. because the the lowest level employee in your mailroom is going to tweet about some horrible treatment that they're getting and the jig is up like it's over right so you just you just have to be you have to be above board with everything that you do i'm sorry i interrupted yeah. you go ahead no no it's good it's, it's like we want to deal with people we trust but we don't necessarily shine that same mirror on ourselves to the same level in our behavior so it's, it's really key and i think one of the benefits and opportunities that business owners have small business owners entrepreneurs is we get to set the the level of trust with the people that we operate. We're not necessarily under a big organization and the hierarchy and the, the culture that feeds down. We're the people that can actually set set the barometer, if you like, um, on that. So it's really good. Um, really good. Well, part of it, think about how you, you treat your employees, right? Like how you treat your team. Yeah. If you treat them that way, they will then by default treat your customers that way, right? Yeah. So I think it starts with, starts with the, the leader and mm -hmm. they set the tone for that that type of culture all the way through and it will pass all the way down through to your end users but it starts with you honestly yeah yeah absolutely so let's let's dig a little bit into the the transition that you made or i suppose the learning point of getting to the point where you could scale up your business um i know there's lots you could say about that and we we don't have enough time to dig into all the nitty-gritty but just a couple of the things for people that are listening thinking i want to grow I, I feel that you know i want to expand i want to scale the business up what would be just a couple of the, the factors they have to think about that are more universal um that they have to get that in place before it's practical before it's going to be more successful um to then grow the business that way yeah, so I would say, um, first of all, we've said it already, growth is going to be messy. So if you wait until you have every single piece on the puzzle in the perfect place, you're never going to grow, right? And, and if I'm honest, you're probably using that level of perfection as an excuse to not grow because it scares you, right? And, and that, like we've all been, I've been there, right? It's like I can, I can in my own mind kind of open and close a business within 20 minutes by <laughs> scaring myself to death, right? By saying like, oh, um, so I would say, you know, you know, first and foremost that you have to get yourself sorted. I mean, entrepreneurship is a personal growth journey disguised as business. You know, that's the best way I've ever heard it described because if you're not leveling yourself up, right over time yeah. um then you're really going to struggle and so you're going to have a hard time um scaling a team right if you're in the same skill set that you were when you were a very small company and you want to go to a mid-sized company 
yes, there's tactical things that you mentioned, like we're going to have to hire the right people and you're going to have to set a different budget and you're going to have to project. And there's a lot of nuts and bolts things that are there. But more importantly is where are you? Because if you can honestly say that your skill level is at a five, but your current opportunity vehicle is at a one, then okay, right? create a different opportunity vehicle. So if you're at a five, create a five level opportunity vehicle. But guess what? If you're still at a one and you're trying to move your company into a four, as far as again, a one through 10 opportunity, um, you're never going to be able to do that. So it really starts by you growing first so that you have the talent to foresee you know, where you're going, that you have the team in place, right, to help you scale. So I would say it starts there with the personal journey. Make sure that you're upskilling yourself in the areas that you need to. Great thing about this day and age, Evan, is that you can you can learn anything that you want. It's at your fingertips. It's on your phone for the most part. I mean, I've taken more courses since I've been in business than I did at university because there's just so many applicable things to learn. Yeah. You know, you can take a Harvard course online now on on disruption or you know business metrics or there's just so much available to us. And those are the things as a leaders that you should be looking into if you want to level up. So I would say that for scaling. And then secondly, you know having a framework that allows people the autonomy to make decisions because you can become, you can fill up the funnel with activity. But if you're the choke point, because everything has to pass through you because you haven't empowered those other leaders around you in your company, you're not going to go anywhere. So there's a real skill to hiring the right people, you know, giving them the support they need, but also just giving them enough breathing room to go and do their job. And in a lot of ways, what I'm always aiming for as we scale is to be the dumbest person in my company, which sounds crazy, but that makes me this, that would make me the best leader that I can imagine would, yeah. would be everyone that I hire for any role is going to be better, infinitely better at that role than I am. And that's what I want. I want to sit around the room and be in awe of the knowledge of my team. And I'm happy to be the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> it's the right room if you are, right? And yeah. so I would say that, again, it sounds very simplistic, but you need to grow personally and change your mindset and change your lens on things and break your belief systems before you're going to be able to scale your company. Because the things that you did to get you where you are now are not the things that you're going to need to do to move forward. And as we know, to move forward, to become something different, you have to kill in some ways. It's a harsh word, but you have to let go of who you were and how you got there. And we all know that loss is painful and loss comes with grief. It sounds weird that you could grieve you know, your old self, but you will. And grief comes with doubt and terrible feelings and imposter syndrome and all the gross things that come along in the day of a life of an entrepreneur. But you got to learn to just sit with it and live with it. Those are perfectly natural. Everyone's having those, right? Yeah. So I know it's a lot to unpack, but does that help? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. I, th- I think you put it very succinctly, actually. Yeah. And as you were saying it as well, I was thinking another element is also being secure in who you are. Like you said about being the dumbest person in the room and being okay with that you're not dumb but just the people around you are smarter in different areas that that are not your strength zones maybe um and i think it's rather than people feel that i need to be saying more i need to look like i'm in control more and in charge and all that like that's all the baggage that insecurity brings isn't it and and you have to be happy with who you are otherwise you're not going to empower your team like you said um and you're just not going to go forward so yeah it makes perfect sense um i know exactly where you're coming from on that um and it's an easy thing to miss. I think um, it's good to be it's good to be reminded of. It's good to hear you say this um, and share with the, the listeners as well. Just so that we do a reality check of yeah, am I actually growing in those areas? Where where is it that I've stagnated? Where is it that I actually need to upskill myself um, so that we can move forward? So all useful yeah, stuff, we were, very practical um, as well. We were sitting in a room recently, and we had some investors in the room. And they were, you know, thinking about rolling out a, a chunk of our franchises, and um, it was interesting because we had our team around the table, and they were speaking to me directly, and they said, "What do you think? Uh, you know, what do you think your biggest threat is to your business right now?" And without, you know, without any hesitation, I said, "Me, basically." <laughs> Like we're only going to go as far as I can allow us to. So I need to continue to grow, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The buck stops with me. So if if I can continue to grow and then hire amazing people like I have, then we're going to be great. But I'm also willing to admit that if I run out of runway, as far as talent is concerned, I would be happy to bring in a CEO or a leader that's done what we're trying to do. I think that's another important thing. If you want to do something, 
just go to someone that's already accomplished that exact same thing and study their behaviors, right? They've done what you want to do. Why would you not, right? Again, it's that ego, like kill your ego, like go to the people that have done it just because they don't look like you or, or don't have the exact same business. Like they've done something very similar. You should really pay attention to that and then kill your ego around being the smartest person in the room. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that the, the group was taken aback, but I did get comments later that that was a very impressive <laughs> response. Yeah. So maybe admitting that you're, you know, that, that you could be, uh, the, the dumbest person in the room is a good thing. I don't know. Yeah, but it shows a good level of self-awareness, doesn't it? Uh, really, to be able to say that. Um, and honesty. Yeah, I mean, well, well, nobody's an expert. Well, it goes back yet, to trust, it? right? What's a more trustworthy statement than that? It can't get any more honest than like, well, if yeah. anything, you know, if we fall short, that's on me. So I have to continue to grow. And if I can't, I'll bring somebody else in that can help us because I just want to win. And I want you guys to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really good. Just in the last couple of minutes that we have today, um, I knew it was going to go fast but it's all good stuff. Um, unpack a little bit more about the franchise part of it. Um, so you focus more on attracting investors for people that are listening, maybe haven't explored the franchise option or have, but doesn't, don't really know much about it. Just again, it's a big question for a very short space of time, but just touch on that a little bit more. Yeah. So we, we commonly get that question. Like, you know, I think people kind of understand what a franchise does, right? But then they'll ask, well, who's your ideal candidate? And we really set the franchise up to, to work for a couple of different individuals. So it's really three scenarios, like for the owner operator. So that's someone who maybe they're already in the fitness space and they've been working for other you know companies and they decide that they want to have a go at it on their own, right? So if they're financially qualified, which we do have financial thresholds, which are the in place to protect the investors, whether it's the owner operator or the true investor, right? If they qualify, then a franchise will give you a massive shortcut to all the business systems and you know the vendors and the, the real estate and the construction, all that stuff is handled. So it's a very nice path for someone who's coming from the fitness space that wants to have, it wants to have a job, but they want to have a different job, a better job, right? And it works for that person as long as they can financially qualify or they get an investor. Then there's the semi-absentee owner. So they're not going to work in the facilities, right? They want to invest and maybe they're going to like lend their expertise to hiring and their entrepreneurial spirit is going to be manifested in managing and leading a team. So that's semi-absentee. And then we have straight up just investors, right? And all the investors are going to do, it's a it's a viable investment option. Um, gives Obviously, it gives a good return on investment or we wouldn't have brought it to market. And so those are folks that want to buy, say, a city or a, a chunk of territories, right? And develop those. And they're probably not going to do a lot of business other than pulling the purse strings and looking at the high-level financials. So it will work for all three of those. And really what a franchise does is it's a uh, in the box, proven, you know, again, tried and tested business model, you know, and for us, we've got a lot of experience and a lot of in-market testing through our licensing business. It gave us a unique approach to franchising. The investment, you know, range is sort of high 100s up to like the mid 300s, you know, 186,000 or so up to around 350. A lot of that depends on where you're putting it. Obviously, we're in the States mostly now, but if you're putting it in Manhattan, it looks different than if it's in rural Oklahoma or something like that, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's why there's an investment range. But yeah, it's, um, you know, again, it's a turnkey business solution for folks that want to be, I think the term best used is intrapreneurs. You know, we don't want somebody too crazy entrepreneurial because they're going to do all kinds of wacky things and, and mess with the systems and like, I know we're doing fitness, but what if I sold food? And what if I did this? It's like, no, 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 we're not doing all that. And there's a reason why we work really hard to bring you the best, simplest, scalable, you know, system in the world. So just stick to it, right? Yeah. So people that have a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit and certainly risk tolerance, but they're also willing to grab someone else's play and go make money with it. You know, that that's really what a franchise does. Yeah, that's really good. And like, you've been successful at it you've got the brand already out there so it's, it's a win-win people want to invest that side of it it's like yeah yeah they're not yeah. recreating everything are they they're, they're literally just getting involved um yeah and just them. run the play which we say all the time and yeah as far as like a worldwide exposure you know we've got over 100 people now worldwide that have our logo tattooed on their body so that's pretty cool. Wow, yeah. And it's all based on some amazing experience, whether it be their business was very successful based on running our systems and that changed their life and or it was an end user who lost weight or had some kind of a, you know, just a massive um, change in their life due to what we do at Alloy. So I can't imagine any more brand loyalty than someone inking it permanently on their body. So we're really proud of that. And it's kind of a fun thing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So that that's not a qualification to be a franchisee, is it? That, that's, it is actually now. Oh, yes, okay. it's a, and we only accept neck, <laughs> the job killer on the neck or the low back. If you get one of those tattoos, you're guaranteed a franchise. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, that's the way you do it. No, that's really good. Does that mean you're in? Are you in? Am I in this correctly? <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I expect you to have a bandage on your neck on the next podcast. That's right. <laughs> no, it all sounds really good. For everybody that, that's been listening to us and they want to know more about you, more about the fitness side of things because they want to get in shape or the business aspect as well, just a bit more about Alloy and the whole system. What's the best way? You're, you're kind of in several different areas, aren't you? But best way for people to touch base and then find out more about you. Yeah, so I would say the best place would be alloyfranchise.com or you can find out about everything franchising. We also have a, a podcast that we do as well. Now, it's very niche around the business of personal training, but we also do a lot of leadership in there as well. So I know that's a, you know, a lot of your listeners are, are into learning about leadership and we talk about a lot of entrepreneurship and mindsets and things like that as well, because they're very important to the entrepreneurial journey. Um, but yeah, alloyfranchise.com and then anywhere on social media, again, Rick Mayo, M-A-Y-O, I'm pretty easy to find on any platform, whether it be LinkedIn or yeah, all of them, really. So just just check us out. And if you have any questions, even if they're personal fitness questions, like, hey, I travel a bunch, I'd like to be in better shape, feel free to shoot us anything that you have and we'll help you in any way that we can. Okay. Perfect. That sounds really good. Thank you. Thanks for your time um, and for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us uh, on this episode. It's been great a, to meet you, but also just to, to hear good stuff, some wisdom coming out of there. Um, and I know everybody listening, if we really take note and we grab hold of one or two things to start with that resonates with where we are as a business owner and put something into action, then we're going to get the benefits. It's, it's like the whole fitness journey, isn't it? If we never hit the gym or exercise, we're not going to get where we'd like to go. Um, there's a practical aspect that we need to do. Uh, we all know that because otherwise we wouldn't be in business or looking to be in business anyway. Um, but it, it's key that you hear good stuff, you put good stuff into action. And then, as Rick has said, you just keep growing. Don't get to the point where you plateau and you think, right, I've grown enough. That's it. Just keep growing. Growing's where there's more fun. You discover more about yourself. We've all got more potential than we realize um, and that we've tapped into so far. So make sure you take action. Uh, we always encourage you to do that because we believe in you. We believe that you have something to contribute to the world through your business, through who you are. So definitely keep growing um, and take action. Thanks again, Rick. Well, well said, my friend. Well said. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks for joining us. Um, you should definitely come back. I think we should definitely chat Chat again. I'd love to. Um, I'd brilliant. love to. Cheers. Thank you. That's brilliant. For everybody else, we will catch you on the next episode. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to Ukai Business Show. We will be back to bring you more episodes with success stories and advice straight from the experts. Want more? Check out www.ukaibusinessshow.com. Get your free trial of our virtual assistance service today. Just visit www.worldoutsourcingsolutions.com. Quote W O S 1 8 or send us an email at support at worldoutsourcingsolutions.com.